Hi everybody, I'm Mark Ciaffardini with Go See Talk and BigFanboy.com. I'm here with the creative minds behind Kin. Jonathan and Josh Baker, thank you so much for coming to Dallas. Thanks for having us, man. This was awesome. Uh, Q&A, if that's any indication on how well this movie's gonna do, I can't wait to see the public that, reaction. That was so. a good Q&A, wasn't it? It, it was, was fantastic, good. fantastic. Yeah. And you know, I think, well, like we talked about, it, it's a little difficult to judge a movie by a trailer these days, because right. you see a movie with a, an alien weapon, and you're not sure, is it for kids, is it for adults? Yeah. But a lot of the feedback, you really hit all target audiences, a lot more adults too. Yeah, which is a surprise because we made it for us. Um, it's one of those things where, you know, you make a movie for you because you want to see it and you hope other people are going to like it. And it's been really encouraging so far to see who's been into this movie. Yeah, we've had some really positive responses from teenagers but also you know older audiences and it's it's pretty encouraging mm -hmm. you know watching it last night i really got the uh the sense it felt a lot like drive like a sci-fi twist on drive That's it cool. also kind of felt like logan in a way because it was so uh, grounded i can see that for sure. so um talking our language <laughs> and then last night you even said it was uh someone said district nine mixed with moonlight yeah. can you speak more yeah. to that uh, interpretation well, of it well look it's about mixing two tones and and trying to fit them both into the same movie, and, and that was the challenge on our side. But we like multiple different things. We like independent film and things that feel a little slower and a little, you know, a little artier. And then we like big films and yeah. with big concepts and specifically sci-fi. So taking those two elements and putting them into the same film and making them work together was what we were really into doing. Yeah, I mean, it was a challenge to take all of these different genres and, and stuff them, mash them all into the one story. But as long as they have that one sort of unique voice and it's just got a flow to it, I think, and I think this does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah I think it really plays. Yeah, it's, it's important for us to make a movie that's just not one thing. And, uh, you know, we don't like being boxed as directors because we've got tastes in a lot of different stuff. And I think this film's the same thing. What was very interesting about the story is it was a you know, road trip, it was a bonding trip, it was very yeah. strongly based in family, but there were a lot of subtextual elements. There was you know, a boy who didn't really have an identity coming into his own, mm. finding a family eventually, and uh, were there things, because it, it was all developed from the Bagman short that you guys created. Yeah. So going from that to this, it's so multi-layered. What was some of the development going from that? Well, you know, Bagman was... The guide, it, it was a self-contained story that we didn't use as a proof of concept to make a movie necessarily. Mm. Uh, I think that actually helped personally because we put a lot of our efforts into that. It was its own thing. It went out, had a life of its own, and then we were inspired by it. And we got together and we said, what are the main elements that should be in a movie version of this? And there's the surface level stuff. Um, you know, the, the bag, the weapon, uh, an African-American lead is important. Yeah. But then, you know, there was so much more. It was all about the uh, family themes and, and what makes brothers and, you know, that sense of belonging of him in a, a adoptive family and then f really coming into his own towards the end of the movie. Right. Um, thanks for the help on that one, Josh. Yeah. <laughs> well, the... I might be reaching here, but it felt like you have three leads. You have uh, Jack Rayner, Zoe Kravitz, and Miles Truitt. And you also have uh, uh, James Franco's character, who yeah. is being uh, the, the aggressor. You have the, uh, the cleaners, who we remain nameless. And then you have the, the, the feds, I guess, if you can call them. So yeah. do you have, you, know, you have three points of contact in the story, yeah. and then you have three people pursuing them. Was that right. a coincidence? or uh... Probably. I think, I think it was mostly on our side of like you've got these multiple storylines and they're all converging and it was about tightening the noose the entire way until the end and, and the audience knows that they're all going to collide at some point and it was about how to tie those three storylines together and then wrap it up in an interesting way that you may not expect and it was tough. Yeah, the edit became a process of taking all of these individual threads and sort of weighing them out, making sure that uh, the real heart of the story remain the brothers and perspective-wise we want to stay with them, we want to experience the road trip with them and not get sort of lost up in sci-fi elements or yeah. you know people tracking them and all of that. But Taylor and his crew, that was a big important thread. Uh, the cleaners, like you said, I'm glad you actually remember they know how to refer to those guys. Um, you know, that was important, but again, that's a very genre element. That's a very side thing. 
that's not what this movie's about. Sure. So, yeah. you know, you have to be very delicate with that stuff. Well, a lot of what was interesting about the story is you didn't get anything spoon-fed to you. You know, you see a battle in the beginning and you see the outer rim of the, the effects of it, you know, yeah. uh, vibrating water. And then you see that when they, uh, Miles Truitt and Jack Rayner take a road trip, you don't get to see their conversations, you get the reactions to. Yeah. So it's like telling a story without telling a story. So did that come yeah. from your advertising background or? Uh, I think it's a bit. A little bit, yeah. I mean, it comes from our taste in cinema as well. I mean, we don't want to put it all out there so that everybody is knows every single thing that's happening and is in front of the characters. Uh, I mean, it's a very delicate thing, and most of that comes from the edit. You, you're just figuring out how much you need. But yeah, we didn't want to spoon feed anyone, so that makes sense. I, I love how it opens, because on a second viewing, you're actually gonna pick up a lot more. You're, you, you're thrust into that in this movie, and you see a lot of sort of sci-fi elements quite quickly, and then we dive into this character story. And so, uh, yeah. I'm looking forward to seeing what you think on the second time. I can't wait, I can't wait. Now, one of the things, I'm a big music fan, so film scores are very uh, passionate to me in my sight. Mogwai, I know of them, yeah. but they're not known to score films, are they? And no, so, so they, they're not they've movies. done some composing before on a TV show, a French TV show called Les, Les Rebanons. Uh, they, they've done a bunch of documentaries. Uh, they're known in the film world. They were actually on the Fountain soundtrack, oh, okay. uh, working with Kronos Quartet and uh, the Clint composer Mansell. of that, Clement Sell. Yeah, that's right. Um, so they've done stuff, but when we were thinking of them, it was it, they hadn't done a feature film. So we basically put a playlist together, and Mogwai rocked up on that playlist quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And so they're one of our favorite bands. And w so we just thought at one point, we should just ask, see if they're into doing it. And it turns out they were. Yeah, we, a, a big thing we talk about is, you know, we're not famous directors, but we go out with good material and surround ourselves by, with good talent and good uh, producing partners. Yep. And you put yourself in a situation where you just ask, and a lot of the time they say yes. So Mogwai was that. You know, we talked about Mogwai for so long as fans of them and, and them as a band. And we just said, read the script, what do you think? And they said yes. Yeah. That easy, huh? Yeah. Well, Sometimes. You, you mentioned something last night which sounded awesome. Uh, their cues in the film are not very long, but you said they're, they're yeah. taking them and develop, developing them into their so own good. album. It yeah. reminds me a lot of what Lamatos, the Canadian outfit, did for Turbo Kid, Chronicles right. of the Wasteland. So that's, that's absolutely right. And it's going to be produced on vinyl. So can you talk to more about that? Yeah, I mean, we didn't really know that. We, I guess we hoped in some ways that that might happen, but it was uh, when we were halfway through the project, and, and I believe when we went to the studio in uh, Glasgow in Scotland where they, they record, mm. and we went and hung out with them for about five days and they were producing music and we were kind of coming up with the, what the final cues were going to be. I think they were kind of nervous to have directors in the studio. Yeah, yeah, yeah no one honest. wants the directors rocking up when you're a band in your yeah. you know, backyard. And we had a good time though, and halfway through the guys looked at us and said, you guys know we're going to put an album out for this, right? And we were like, uh, <coughs> excuse me? <laughs> I thought so you they, said you are going to put an album out. <laughs> and so they took nine tracks that some of them were quite short, some of them maybe two minutes, and they extended them out to you know, song length. Mm -hmm. Some of them they added vocals, some of them they changed the, the, the feeling of them, and they made it their own, and they're going to be putting out a Mogwai album called Kin, which is still ridiculous to wow. us. And they love it. Like Stuart reaches out to us and says, "This is some of the best music we've ever yeah. recorded," and to be in the studio with them for that experience is priceless. Oh, it's man. an honor. And so, really, having that vinyl, having that exclusive red sort of <laughs> vinyl version of it—that's that's, that's going to be a little dream come true. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, talk because a lot of times when you're an artist, the most difficult thing about your process is a blank canvas. Yeah. So now they're getting something that they worked on, and yeah. you know, if they couldn't do it to a scene, now they get to no, yeah. extrapolate. And they also stretched their legs a little bit, tried something different, and they got something out of it, which was really exciting. You know, they've been making music for 20 odd years, right. and now they got the experience of actually scoring to a story, to, to characters. Completely. And, and then we can surround the film by with this cool stuff that uh, didn't exist before. I mean, I know if I was watching this movie, I would love to own this album. So, yeah. Hopefully they get to tour it, that'd be awesome. Uh, 
Sweet. You imagine watching that. Yeah. Come on, guys. Stage would be full of guns, right? Oh, just. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, um, of, of, of the, the trio of characters, uh, Miles Truitt's his work speaks for itself. This is his first film. And He's then great. Zoe Kravitz is great, so is uh, Jack Rayner. But uh, you mentioned that Miles came in late in the process and That's nailed right. it. Uh, Jack Rayner, you were a fan of from yeah. Um, yeah, Sing Street and some others. But Zoe has just this magnetic. You know, she delivery does. and her eyes really draw you in. So, yeah. what once you started shooting, what about them on screen really made you? Yeah, these are these are this is well, what we want. Did you you got into her performance? You, oh yeah, totally. Yeah, she, yeah. I mean, look, it's about the the trio in this film. I mean, there's there's a, a few characters going on, and and Dennis is important, and obviously our bad guy, James Franco is important. But it's really about this trio and how these broken characters together as this weird little family group get along and connect. And it was really important that this female presence on the two boys who are kind of, you know, lost at the end of the day and, and kind of making these bad decisions as they go on. And she becomes a little, little bit more of the voice of reason. It was important that she was warm, it, she was cool, she was sexy, and all of those three things are really hard to find in, in, the, in the one actress, and Zoe is kind of all of that stuff. We, we had an image in our heads what the Millie character would look like, and, and Zoe was our number one choice. But putting a platinum blonde wig on some you know, other actress just didn't feel right at all, and uh, she encapsulated everything we wanted, especially her sense of authenticity. Yeah. And so coming in, she, she was super cool with the guys. She Miles was like a little brother. Mm -hmm. And he learned from a lot of great actors. It was a great experience. Yeah, he again. did. I also think with her role, we could have very easily taken it down a road of, you know, a love relationship with Jimmy's character, um, you know, sex scene here or there. Like it's just from the very beginning, we decided not to go that route. Yeah. We, we wanted them to be much more like brother and sister relationship. It was about family. Um, yeah. and, and keep it within the family, which I think is a stronger decision at the end of the day. I agree completely. But what you did is you created this world that, um, advertising background notwithstanding, you really, uh, we talked about it last night, you did um, references to movies you like, yeah. you know, and it, it's for the viewers to find out the little Easter eggs. But one yeah. of the things that I, I liked so much, there was, the exact opposite of product placement. You created alternate sprite cans. You never showed yeah, yeah, any yeah, labels. So, that? so did awesome. you, you know, like what, what, what went into creating this so you didn't have to pay anybody any money? <laughs> well, uh, we, well we, did. We, we, we did. We did a couple things. Like, like we, had, we had a couple Ducatis in there that we, you know, a yeah. right. couple the little stuff, things yeah. like that. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think it was a conversation about let's create a timeless, um, nostalgic, modern world. You know, it's not a period piece film. It's not a dystopian future. It's just, it's just a now story, but mm -hmm. it, it has got a very textural, very old school sensibility about it where we're shooting in a lot of locations that feel like they're not franchised modern, you know, spots. Yeah, so I agree. Old sort of strip clubs, casinos, um, you know, old blue collar houses in, in working class neighborhoods. All of that texture really added to what Ken became. Yeah, it's a good point. You, you try to keep the film without a time, in a way. And I, I, think, that was, I think that was a really good decision from... It becomes more classic like yeah, that. Yeah, our Absolutely. production designer, Ethan Tobman, was uh, you know, a huge collaborator on this. And we built a lot of stuff, but we also found a lot of gritty locations to shoot in. Mm -hmm. And I think the whole thing in combination has this timeless feel where you know, it could be late 80s, could be 90s, could be 2000s, I don't know. Well, as you come from a, uh, a movie-loving background, do you have one movie that you feel like unified you? We usually say Back to the Future, but I'll see if I can pick another film. Uh, we've probably seen that thing a thousand times, and I remember that was definitely a go-to for us. It but was also one of the first examples of like a really super sci-fi idea in a very regular family setting with a very regular character in, mm. in Marty McFly. Yeah, it's a perfect film, but I would say... Maybe E.T. is something that, we, that, that really uh, had an impact on our childhood and maybe kind of built the way that we look at stories in a lot of ways. Uh, you could probably, one could say that the alien tech in this could be like E.T. and the relationship between it and the boy and how it has to return at the end. It's 
you go back some similarities. you go back and you watch et for instance and it, and it has got a little bit of edge to it you know i was actually surprised some of the dialogue that they got away with yeah. in, the, in the 80s <laughs> and there is really quiet intimate moments as well and that's important for us that we're not just getting carried away with a big genre sci-fi movie that doesn't have like really intimate connection moments with these characters and so as you notice there's like weird little scenes like the owl scene right. that um, normal movies would have cut out you know and we fought for yeah because I think it influences the lyrical quality of the entire film and and it, like I was saying before about not being just one thing, I think it was important to us to have energetic, fast-paced scenes that felt maybe a little slicker, but then also contrast that with slower scenes that are more about character and kind of give you a window into what's happening with these people. Mm. Well, I think everything you guys set out to do, you did, so I, I can't wait for people to see this. This is such a fantastic movie. That's funny, man. Thank you. That was a great compliment. Thanks so much for your time. No, thanks, man.